And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So after my senior year in high school, before I went to college, my church sent me to a leadership training camp, Camp Maravissa, up in New Hampshire. And one afternoon, they told our group, you're going to hike up to the top of this mountain. And I remember the group trying to figure out you know, well, you know, surely we'll be home for dinner in dinner time. So it's probably, you know, you know, two hours up, an hour down, something like that. And, uh, and, and we set off. And when we made it to the top of the mountain, one of the, oh, I forgot to add that one of the counselors, I was surprised because one of our counselors uh, was disabled in some way. She walked with hand crutches and she was coming. And then when we got up at the top of the mountain, the other counselors asked us, okay, who showed leadership on the way up? And, it, and what we came to, it wasn't the people up front who showed leadership. It was the people in the back who made it sure that everybody made it up the mountain. I have never forgotten that lesson. Uh, and I need to confess to you that at one point I was so far ahead with a friend that we had to sit down and wait for everybody to, to catch up. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm pretty sure, I don't remember, but I'm guessing, okay, dinner time's at six and we are going to get back in time for that food. <laughs> but what's interesting about, in reflecting about that, because it also came to my mind another time, it was right before my ordination, I had some friends come uh, for my ordination service, and we went into the city, and you know, normally, you know, coming back, taking the train, there's a, there's a train every hour on the, on the way back, but on that particular day, as I'm reading it, they were doing work on the line, so there was a last train, and at one point, I put it into high gear when we were walking, and they were like, rah, 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 you know, and they were complaining the whole way, and then when we made the train, they said the only reason we made this train is because Robin pushed us so. And so that made me think that, you know, leadership depends, what good leadership depends on the situation. What is the leadership that's called for? And therefore we are praying and look, looking to God, what is needed now and in this circumstance? It's just like love, like sometimes tough love is what's required. Other times it's forgiving love, gracious love. Um, but again, what this means is that we always have to be looking to God and praying and so grateful in scripture for that promise that Jesus said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised again. So we worship the risen Lord. The Holy Spirit is alive and well to help die. And we have this wonderful counselor that uh, is lifted up in Isaiah and in Hebrews and by Handel in, in the Messiah. In our scripture lesson, Jesus has just predicted his death again. It happens three times in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, we talked about the first prediction, and there's a pattern to these, prediction, to these predictions. Jesus you know, predicts his own death, 
and resurrection, the disciples have some sort of clumsy response to it. And then Jesus has some teaching for everyone. So in between last week's prediction in chapter eight and this week's prediction in chapter nine, there has been the transfiguration. And the transfiguration in the gospel mark is like the top of, it's the climax of the story. Up until, up until now, you know, Jesus has been preaching and teaching and healing and gathering crowds and fame and, and, and a following. And then after the transfiguration, he's walking down the mountain into Jerusalem to his death. So that has happened. Uh, then there's a question about the coming of Elijah. Then there's the healing of the, of the boy that could only come out through prayer. And that wonderful, one of my favorite passages in scripture where the father says, help my belief, or no, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Thank God that that's in scripture, right? And then, you know, and of course the disciples can't, you know, they've been healing, but they can't get that, they can't heal that boy, right? But right from that, Jesus predicts his, his death again. And there's silence. And Jesus asks them, what, what have you been talking about? And they're silent because they've been arguing about who's the greatest, which is so very human, as Martha said. You know, one of the one of the commentators that I read said, only insecure people brag on themselves. They're trying to convince themselves as well as the world, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm worthy, I'm enough. The disciples had been taken from obscurity. Most of them had no, you know, they were on the low rung of the, of the, of the social ladder when all of this started. And now they're BFFs with this rabbi who, you know, people are coming out. I mean, thousands of people are coming out to hear him and to see him. And gosh, they, with him, through him, they've been able to heal people. And whoo, look at us. And then Peter last week, you know, confessed, we believe that you're the, the Messiah. And of course, their understanding of that, again, is that he would be an earthly king, right? And that the, uh, through Jesus, or Jesus was going to be the Messiah that was going to uh, uh, restore the political fortunes of the, of the Jewish people, right? Basically, turn the ladder over. They were on the bottom, and now they're going to be on the top. That's their hope. They never questioned the latter. But Jesus does. Whoever wants to be first must be last and a servant to all. It's not about who has the most power or privilege if you're not using it to serve the least of these. Otherwise, you're not getting it. And then Jesus takes a child, and I and I and I gotta tell you, it's that Jesus, you know, takes a child and then lifts the child up like object lesson, right? And with all the training that we have now as pastors, you're like, no, we can just take a child, right? You can touch the child. We don't touch children <laughs> now, right? You know, so you know, midrash, Jewish midrash, when you read between the lines. So that's what I did have to do with this passage. So Jesus went, goes to the mother and says, Hey, can I? can I use your child kind of like as a for an object lesson? And the mother says, yes, right? And so Jesus takes the child by the hand and then the child reaches up and says, pick me up. And Jesus looks to the mother and is it okay? And the mother says, yes. And so Jesus picks the child up and now we're okay, right? And then Jesus says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Who? And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The child is on the bottom rung. The child has nothing to offer society, only needs to be taken care of. Albeit, more midrash, if you're paying attention to the child, your world is filled with delight and wonder. But Jesus is not just turning everything on his head, he's also pulling out the rug from everybody so that they all fall on their butts. Just think of those moments in our communal history when we all find ourselves on the ground just looking at each other going, everybody okay? Are we all good? What do you need? You know, some, telling our story, sometimes, you know, laughing at ourselves because the mighty as well as the meek have all found themselves in the same position. 
It's, it's how we felt after 9-11, the way the world came together. It's hearing the stories, my, my mother-in-law who was in Puerto Rico for the Hurricane Maria and I mean, devastation and everybody coming out into the streets afterwards and that sense of community that, that came out of that time. She was not gonna leave her people. Right? COVID could have done that. We could have done that with COVID, but we didn't. Jesus would have us live in that spirit, that communal spirit, that world coming together spirit each and every day. But we're human beings. We get lost in the competition, you know, vying for resources or position for influence because we do not want to be on that bottom rung of that ladder. And there are some who will say that the ladder is a given. There are some who are going to be on top and there's some who are going to be below. But the goat, the greatest of all time, am I the only one who just learned what that means? Have you, my, my, my son was telling me, and he comes out of his bedroom one time, he plays video games and he's reconnected with a friend and his friend called him the goat. And I was like, what do you mean the goat? And he goes, like, the greatest of all time. And I'm like, oh, he called you the goat. He like, so, you know, that's a good thing, right? And so that's what, tell me afterwards. Please tell me, somebody tell me that that's the first time you've heard that, please, right? I just, just thank you. All right. And then I, I, my, my son is here. I told him on, on the car on the way. I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to tell a story about you. And he goes, and he, he's, the other thing about the goat is that it's also at the top of the mountain. And I'm like, ooh, that'll preach too. Our mountain stories this morning. But the greatest of all time, Jesus tells us that in the reign of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the latter is not a thing. Scripture says that the disciples were afraid, and that's a theme in Mark. And the second time, Jesus is predicting his death, and we can understand why they might be afraid to speak because last time somebody spoke, Peter, Jesus says, you know, likens him to Satan. So they're like, say anything but it also could be that they're realizing that the glory that they have been seeking and have been hoping for isn't going to be anything that they like they thought it was going to be it's not going to be parades and fine linen linens it's going to be sacrifice and and suffering and servanthood for today you might say it's going to be protests and picket lines Standing with the least, and not the least worthy, but those who have the least power in society, in the system, those on the lowest rung. And I say that when, and I say that knowing that different people, different segments of society are going to come to mind for all of us. You know, the prophets would say orphans and widows, the folks who have nobody to take care of them. And we have disagreements about power and privilege and who has it and who doesn't. So let us. Let us be open to listening to one another and learning from one another. God puts people on our hearts for a reason, and it does not have to be an either or. It can be a both and. Actually, it's an all of the above. For God so loved the world. But also, let's be clear that if someone comes, asks you whether you care about them, whether they matter to you, the answer is yes. Otherwise, it's no. But that being said, it's absolutely overwhelming at times, this idea that we're supposed to care for everybody. You know, I think we wrestle with our own selfishness and self-centeredness, like, come on, folks, let's move it. Dinner's waiting. And for those who have decided to follow Jesus, you know, from obscurity to obscurity, we can get overwhelmed by the need because there's just so much. Every once in a while, it appears in my Facebook feed, somebody posts this. The Jewish Talmud states, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly, do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Keep on keeping on, such wise words. We can't cure the world's ills, but we can do what we can do today and tomorrow and the next day.
once Jesus has rocked our world, caused us to fall on our butts and look around, you know, embarrassed, but also looking for camaraderie. We hold out our hand, we hold hands, maybe we lift one another up and we thank God for giving us a heart for the least of these. Because focusing on ourselves, it's never enough. There's never enough praise. There's never enough reassurance. But when we focus on others and forget ourselves, ah, freedom. We are saved from all the nonsense and delivered to what really matters. That we're all in this together. And if we're all in this together, let love be our guide. Love that doesn't argue about who's better than whom or who should get the better seat at the table, but is actually continually making room at the table for one more so that we are welcoming. Again and again. The disciples, by the way, will look foolish for the rest of the gospel. <laughs> they just don't get it. And let us confess that we don't always get it or live it out. Jesus would ask us, so what were you talking about on the way here? And we might be embarrassed by what occupies our minds. Faith in Christ upends us, undoes us, and in our undoing and our falling and the humility we find, sometimes forced upon us, we brush ourselves off and offer to help one another with an encouraging smile and an outreach hand. Remember that God is at work in the smallest act of kindness. And when we're able to forget ourselves, what an absolute blessing, freedom and salvation. This is silly, but I, but I wrote this. Every time we forget ourselves, an angel gets its wings. Right? No. The kingdom of God reigns on earth as it is in heaven. And in that forgetting of ourselves, we find joy. I don't remember much about the walk down from that mountain at that leadership camp that I went to when I was young. But I'm pretty sure that we walked together. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen. Amen.